Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of A.J. Armstrong? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Antonio Armstrong Jr. was born on March 23, 2000, in Houston, Texas. He went by the name AJ. His father, Antonio Sr., and his mother, Dawn, owned a chain of smoothie shops and a fitness business. Prior to this, Antonio Sr. had briefly played professional football for the NFL, but could not find success. He went to the Canadian Football League, where an ankle injury ended his career. AJ had a sister named Kayra and a half-brother named Josh. His sister lived with him and his parents, while his half-brother lived in an apartment within walking distance of the Armstrong family residence. By the time AJ was 16, he was using marijuana and performing poorly in school. As a result, his parents delivered a series of punishments, including removing him from a prestigious private school and sending him to public school, taking away a Ford Mustang that AJ had been allowed to use, and giving it to his half-brother, and restricting AJ from seeing his girlfriend. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On July 29, 2016, at 1.40 a.m., AJ called 911 and claimed that he had heard gunshots from his parents' bedroom on the second floor. He was hiding in the closet of his third-floor bedroom out of fear. AJ's 12-year-old sister, Kayra, was in the house. After a few minutes, AJ went to her bedroom on the second floor, and they both walked down to the first floor. Sixteen minutes into the 911 call, the police arrived. AJ disarmed the security system and answered the front door. Here's what the police found during the course of their investigation. While they were in bed, AJ's parents had been shot with a 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol, which was owned by AJ's father. AJ's mother was shot twice in the head and did not survive. AJ's father was shot one time in the head. He was alive when the police arrived, but died shortly after being transported to a hospital. Both of AJ's parents had pillows placed over their heads after they were shot. There was no forced entry into the house, and nothing appeared to be missing. On the first floor, several kitchen drawers were pulled open. There was a note on the kitchen counter which read, quote, I have been watching for a long time. Come get me, unquote. Right next to the note was a 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol. It was the murder weapon. There was no DNA, blood, or fingerprints on the firearm, the note, the notepad, or the pen used to write the note. No gloves were found at the crime scene. In AJ's bedroom, there was a hole in the floor, which had clearly been created by a 22 caliber firearm. It appeared as though someone discharged the gun into a pillow and a blanket while pointing it at the floor. The bullet traveled into a study on the second floor, which was right outside the bedroom of AJ's parents. There was a pile of socks over the hole, as if somebody wanted to conceal it. The carpet at the top of the second floor staircase had a burn mark on it. It appeared as though gasoline had been used in the fire. The police took AJ into custody. They did not see any blood on him, and a gunshot residue test came back negative. AJ unwisely decided to talk to the police. Here is the story that he supplied them. On July 28, AJ and his sister arrived home at about 9 or 10 p.m., and the alarm was set. AJ watched Netflix for a while as his parents were in their bedroom. At around 1 a.m., now on July 29, AJ went to the bathroom. During this trip, he heard a door open. He thought it was his parents. AJ had not been feeling well, so he started to walk downstairs to ask them for medicine. At this point, he heard gunshots and saw an intruder wearing a mask running in the house. He described the intruder as a black man who was six feet tall. This was the first time AJ had mentioned an intruder, even though he had spent 16 minutes on the phone with the 911 operator. The police asked AJ if he had ever handled the 22 caliber pistol that was used to shoot his parents. He said that he had fired it several years ago, but had not touched it recently. When confronted about the discovery of the hole in the floor in his bedroom, A.J. came up with a new story. 
He said that a few weeks prior to the shootings, he was showing the gun to a friend and pulled the trigger unintentionally. The police were curious about the burn mark at the top of the second floor staircase. AJ explained that he was playing with matches and dropped one there. Despite denying any involvement in the shooting, AJ was arrested and charged with murder. He was eventually released on bond. AJ's trial started on April 2, 2019. The defense tried to create doubt by suggesting that AJ's half-brother, Josh Armstrong, could have committed the murders. He suffered from schizophrenia and was paranoid. Josh had spent time in several different mental health facilities. He had delusions, which included believing that he was God or the devil. He had command hallucinations that told him to harm himself or others. And he told a mental health professional that he witnessed his parents being murdered. The jury was unable to reach a unanimous decision. They deadlocked 8-4 to four in favor of a guilty verdict. A mistrial was declared. AJ's second trial started on October 3, 2022. A mistrial was declared on October 26. This time, the jury deadlocked 8-4 to four in favor of a not guilty verdict. On July 31, 2023, AJ's third trial started. This time, the state introduced new and surprising evidence. Law enforcement claimed that they found specks of blood underneath an adhesive visitor's badge, which was placed on AJ's shirt in the police station right after the shooting. The DNA in the blood was matched to his father's DNA. On August 16, 2023, Antonio Armstrong Jr. was found guilty of capital murder. His sentence was life in prison with the possibility of parole After 40 years, he will be 63 years old when he becomes eligible for release. Now moving to my analysis. A.J. Armstrong maintains his innocence, and he has many supporters, including several of his family members. They argue that a mysterious intruder must have killed A.J.'s parents. The state, of course, disagrees. They believe it was painfully obvious the entire time that A.J. was the killer, and there was no good reason for two mistrials. This brings me to the question, Was A.J. guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence, both for and against the idea that he was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. In the time leading up to the murders, A.J. was using marijuana and performing poorly in school. He had endured a string of punishments from his parents, including being pulled out of a private school, losing his vehicle, and not being able to see his girlfriend. Text messages from his mother, Dawn, revealed that she believed he was a deceptive individual. During the interview with the police, A.J. painted his mother in a negative light, even though she had just been murdered. Evidence at the crime scene indicated that A.J.'s mother was the first one who was shot. It is unlikely that an intruder would have put pillows over the victims' heads after shooting them. There was no forced entry into the house, and all the doors and windows were locked. The murder weapon was a gun owned by A.J.'s father. Even if an intruder could have made entry into the house undetected. How would they have accessed the weapon, and why would they do that? AJ was extremely calm on the 911 call and never mentioned seeing an intruder despite being on the phone for 16 minutes. He only introduced the intruder story during the police interview. The Armstrong family house was equipped with an alarm system featuring motion detectors on the first floor and the second floor. By looking at the data from the system and from AJ's phone, it seems clear that A.J. was moving around the house at the time of the shooting. For example, at 1.08 a.m., A.J.'s phone was unplugged. At 1.09 a.m., movement was detected by the second floor motion detector. At 1.25 a.m., the first floor motion detector detected movement. The murder weapon and the note were found on the first floor. This was 15 minutes before A.J. called 911. A.J. went to his sister's bedroom while on the phone with the 911 operator. He had to walk past his parents' bedroom to get there, yet he never checked on his parents. A.J. admitted that he shot a hole through his bedroom floor with the murder weapon, although he denied doing so on purpose. The bullet traveled through a pillow and a blanket before striking the floor, which seems unusual for an accidental shooting. Did A.J. have some type of grudge against the pillow? I suppose A.J. would have prevailed during any pillow fight. It seems clear that A.J. was trying to muffle the gunshot. His behavior is consistent with premeditation. Two days before the murder, A.J. started a fire in his house 
probably by using gasoline. In addition to firing the gun in his bedroom and setting a fire, AJ searched the internet for how to build a car bomb. Either he wanted to murder a driving pillow, or he was trying to find a way to kill his parents. Although it was years later, the police found blood belonging to AJ's father on the shirt AJ was wearing the night of the shooting. As far as the defense theory that Josh Armstrong could have been the real killer, he was with his girlfriend and his cousin at the time of the shooting. Josh was ruled out as a suspect by the police. Whatever mental health problems that Josh may or may not have had were irrelevant because his alibi was confirmed. Moving to the exculpatory factors, even though AJ had behavioral problems and argued with his parents, these behaviors are common for teenagers. As far as there being no forced entry into the house, the alarm system was improperly installed and did not function correctly. It is possible that an intruder was in the house before the alarm was set. This would also explain how the intruder had time to retrieve the pistol owned by AJ's father. No blood was observed on AJ, and none was found even after the police conducted extensive testing on his clothing not long after the shooting. The police only found specks of blood belonging to his father seven years later, after two mistrials and right as the third trial was starting. This seems incredibly convenient for the police. No physical evidence connected AJ to the murder or to the note. Less than two weeks after the murders, two intruders wearing masks broke into one of the gyms owned by AJ's parents. They appeared to be looking for something specific and only took a computer despite other valuables being in plain sight. They were never identified or arrested. When considering all the evidence, do I believe that AJ was guilty? Yes, I believe he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. When I weighed the evidence, I dismissed the mysterious and incredibly convenient discovery of the blood under the sticker on AJ's shirt. Even without that evidence, I believe he was guilty. There should have never been mistrials in this case. Some of the members of the jury for the third trial indicated that they also dismissed the blood evidence completely. They found AJ guilty because he shot a hole in the floor and set a fire before the murders and lied repeatedly after the murders. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. AJ was intelligent and articulate, but possessed a few worrisome traits, including impulsivity, irresponsibility, recklessness, vindictiveness, arrogance, a sense of entitlement, and a lack of empathy. He became angry with his parents because they restricted his freedom and decided that killing them would be an appropriate solution. He was cold and callous. AJ believed that he was more intelligent than everyone else and could easily manipulate people. The problem is he failed to appreciate his own lack of empathy. AJ could not understand how people perceived him. He carried out a clumsy and obvious crime which should have led directly to a conviction, yet somehow he was able to stall the inevitable. The lack of physical evidence tying him to the crime worked strongly in his favor. When AJ was out on bail, he married his girlfriend and had a son, further demonstrating his overconfidence and arrogance. He was trying to live as if prison was not in his future, and perhaps deceived other people into believing the same thing. Ultimately, AJ was convicted, but still remained overconfident. He believes that he will win his appeal and be set free. This is yet another in a series of fantastical creations by AJ, like the invisible intruder who killed his parents. Now moving to my final thoughts. AJ's parents had a security system installed to protect the house and hold any criminal in the house responsible. Ultimately, only the latter was realized as a benefit. This case is a testament to the effectiveness of betrayal. The killer had easy access to the victims, and they probably had no idea what he was planning. Some murder cases come with a mystery, like people may wonder who committed the crime. In this case, the mystery was why anyone believed that AJ was not guilty. AJ was completely ineffective and inept as a criminal, but manipulative and endearing as a defendant. Fortunately, the state did not succumb to the pressure of all the people who believed that A.J. was not guilty and remained committed to achieving his conviction. Those are my thoughts in the case of A.J. Armstrong. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. 
As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.